So I'm Jessie Minion. I'm a medical microbiologist here in Regina. And I'm going to tell you about antibiograms. And I, with the disclaimer that people who have heard me talk about antibiograms in the past may not find much of this information terribly surprising because, what a shock, antibiograms have not undergone a significant sea change in the last five years. Uh, but we'll go over them again because we do repeatedly get kind of the same questions from different people and from different areas. So I think that it's worthwhile reviewing what goes into these antibiograms and how we expect you to use them uh, and give you guys really the opportunity to ask any questions that come up and I will try my best to adhere to the time provided for me. So. The objectives that I kind of gave us for today was to talk about really understanding where your antibiogram is coming from when it talks to you. And then we want you to really build a better relationship with your antibiogram. And then if we've got time, I'm going to fill in that uh, spare time on my platform to talk about susceptibility, which is really the foundation of why you have a relationship with your antibiogram in the first place. So. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to declare. So we'll get started with getting to know this very important entity that is your antibiogram. So if we ask the question, what is an antibiogram? It is very simple, I mean, as far as just saying the words, but it is a cumulative susceptibility report. So it is an amalgamation of aggregate level antimicrobial resistance data that comes from a specific microbiology laboratory. And so another way to think of it is we are reporting on the activities of the microbiology lab that have already occurred with the aim to predict what future results are going to be. So keys in this kind of definition, it is for a specific period of time for a specific population that the lab needs to identify, okay? And so just like if we think about a single result that is coming out on a patient with an isolate of an organism, that one organism is going to have binary results. Either it is susceptible or it is not susceptible. But when you roll those up together, you get a percentage. What percentage of those results are going to be susceptible versus non-susceptible, okay? So what can you use these things for? So the most common reason that clinicians are going to use them is to empirically make their decisions about treatment for infections. Is what is the likelihood that an infection caused by this certain organism in my population that I'm looking at going to be susceptible versus resistant? We can also use them to monitor trends in resistance. So we follow them over time as long as they are constructed in similar ways and without major variations in that kind of survey uh, methodology. You can monitor them over time to see if you're getting better, worse, or staying the same. And along with that, for an antimicrobial stewardship program, you can use them to help target your initiatives that you're going to focus on. And simultaneously, the, what goes hand in hand with that is that if you do have initiatives that, who, that their goal is primarily to reduce antimicrobial resistance in your population, then you can monitor the effectiveness of those, those interventions. Now, keeping in mind that like many other things in infectious diseases, the number of factors that influence the overarching rate of resistance in a population are very broad, and many of them are outside of uh, an antimicrobial stewardship's program's um, uh, control, that is what we should keep in mind is the goal of antimicrobial stewardship programs. Whether it be a short-term or a long, long, long-term goal, the goal is to preserve the effectiveness of our antimicrobials. <coughs> and then you can also use them basically to analyze and drill down into subgroups if that information is available to you to determine or extrapolate what kind of drivers you think are contributing to resistance in your community. 
So we'll get into <coughs> subgroups a little bit later. But to be completely clear about what goes into an antibiogram and what doesn't, this is basically a list, but I want to make sure that everybody understands it is only final verified test results. So when you get microbiology results on your patients, you will often notice that there are preliminary results, there are interim results, and we sometimes fiddle with these things. And we try our best to go from worst case scenario to best case scenario, but often it is an iterative report. So only the last, the last word that we are com completely confident about goes into an antibiogram. We want to, at least for the overarching um, overall analysis of an antibiogram, use isolates that have at least 30 representative strains that have been tested. And 30 is a, a magical number that is based basically on statistics with the acknowledgement that, we are tr that you are using it to try to predict the next result. So if you have less than 30 isolates, your confidence intervals of, okay, it's, this is, these, these organisms are 80% susceptible. If that confidence interval is, it's 80% susceptible plus or minus 20%, that's not very helpful to you as far as predicting the result of the next organism. Uh, relevance, so we only include diagnostic isolates. So people often ask about this. So we screen for, let's say, MRSA all the time or VRE for infection control purposes. And so there is a huge number, a huge volume of microbiology uh, test results that go out that are specifically looking for those antibiotic resistant organisms. Those need to be excluded from your antibiogram. So if you are a lab, you need to be able to know if you got a screening specimen or a diagnostic specimen. Usually that's quite straightforward because they are treated quite differently in the lab, uh, but depending on the setup of your laboratory information system, that might be a challenge. Similarly, a factor that is often um, easier said than done for lab information systems is eliminating duplicates. So this is equally very important so if you have a very recalcitrant infection with an antimicrobial organism, it is more likely that that recurrent or um, difficult to treat infection is a drug resistant uh, infection. And so if you have an individual that has multiple cultures every day that we are trying to eradicate a bloodstream infection with MRSA, we don't want to count that person more than once. So we need to be able in our lab systems to eliminate any subsequent organisms of that species in one calendar year. Okay, so in a given yearly antibiogram, each individual patient only gets to contribute one susceptibility result per isolate. Okay, so that also explains or is the reason often for numbers in your antibiogram not adding up. So for instance, you might have a thousand Staph aureus listed on your antibiogram and 400 of them are uh, MSSA and 650 of them are MRSA. You're like, wait, 400 plus 650 is 1,050, where did those extra 50 isolates come from? They're coming from when uh, some, those 50 individuals are likely to have had both an MSSA and an MRSA contributing to your lab antibiogram. So when you search for all Staph aureuses, only one of those is going to count, and it's usually the first one. So whichever one they had first, if it is an MSSA, that's going into the all Staph aureus estimate. But then when you search for MRSA specifically, it will count it as an MRSA. Okay, so don't expect the numbers to add up. It's okay that they don't. Um, we need to make sure, on the lab's point of view, that the only drugs that get tested are ones that are routinely selected, on, tested on all the isolates that go out. So you can imagine in the lab, we do have uh, kind of 
um, I'm gonna say flow charts, but cascading as far as susceptibility testing goes. So a good example is uh, stenotrophomonas. The first, second, and third line therapy that is appropriate for stenotrophomonas is gonna be SEPTRA. So we only test SEPTRA at the beginning in our lab, and if it's resistant, we will test second and third line drugs, or if we wanna call them fourth and fifth line drugs. So I can't give you an antibiogram estimate of those further line drugs because we only tested them on isolates that were already found to be resistant. Okay, so that would enrich the population of isolates that are proven to have a drug resistance to one class and we know that drug resistance does seem to cluster, right? So the, the way that it's transmitted, it's transmitted often in these uh, plasmids or aggregates of genetic material that, are, that, that get passed along to other bugs simultaneously. So being resistant to one antimicrobial does, in a statistically speaking point of view, predispose you to testing resistant to another class of antibiotics. And then, we, just a note, you probably would notice, but uh, to, these uh, antibiograms are reported as binary, either a pro so it's a proportion calculation, the proportion susceptible to the proportion non-susceptible. So that's not resistant, that's non-susceptible, which includes both intermediate and resistant results. Okay. So these are all things that when you look at say, a prevalence survey study that gets published in the literature, you would consider this to be part of their methods in order to judge whether or not their estimate is a valid reflection of what you're trying to get at, okay? And it's not, it's not dissimilar to that. If we screw up our survey, uh, then we will have less valid results. And I will go into the limitations because the antibiograms are not well-designed <laughs> prevalence surveys. So what can influence your anti antibiogram results? The patient population that is actually being served. So if you have a microbiology lab that only accepts specimens from their hospital, and so that's the majority of hospitals in Ontario, but in various centers, you may or may not know these details because we shift work around sometimes. But that is important that if, you, if that lab is only accepting specimens from a hospital or from the community com compared to expect accepting both, then that will change what we expect the resistance rates to be. Uh, similarly, if I mean, as you can imagine, if your patient population is uh, a, has a travel clinic in it that has a large volume of international travelers coming through, or let's see, say it processes uh, immigration health checks, that would predispose your population to having more resistant bugs, probably. Okay, and so when you're using it to predict the results of the next bug, you need to keep that in mind. What was the patient population that created the results in the first place? Lab utilization patterns. So this is something that we cannot control and yet has a tremendous influence on what the antibiogram will look like. So if your physician's kind of culture of practice is to, let's say, empirically treat all skin and soft tissue infections with Keflex, and then the only swabs that get taken from those skin and soft tissue infections are individuals who have failed empiric therapy. Then you're going to have an enriched population in the lab of MRSA, of keflex resistant organisms. Similarly, with urinary tract infections, if, you, if your practitioners are given the instructions that they should empirically treat their UTIs with SEPTRA, the, and they only send specimens to the lab, which have, are basically treatment failures of SEPTRA, you're going to have an enriched view of SEPTRA resistance, okay? 
So knowing that and having an idea and being able to clinically extrapolate what do we think our physicians are doing, are they actually ordering sputums on every single patient they diagnose with community-acquired pneumonia? Probably not, compared to are they sending sputum specimens on every single hospital-acquired pneumonia? More likely, right? So just like this is not a well-designed kind of study that is a standalone research project, you should not expect the antibiogram results to be as high quality as a, a research study. Lab protocols and policies. So, I mean, an example of that is what I described, the cascade uh, reporting of antibiotics. Um, but there, there's other examples, too, that do you... Uh, would, would a lab uh, report out Staph aureus that is in a very small amount in a respiratory tract infection or a respiratory tract specimen? Okay, so you've got four plus normal flora and two plus Staph aureus. Is the lab going to tell you about the Staph aureus and do a susceptibility on it? The answer may be yes and it may be no, depending on their microbiology. Uh, expertise and guidance that they receive. Okay. And then temporal outbreaks. So we see this in real time in our QHR. When we have VRE outbreaks, uh, the percentage of enterococcus that are resistant to vancomycin in clinical <coughs> specimens skyrockets. And then we get our outbreaks cleared up and everybody remembers how to wash their hands again. And then the antibiogram susceptibility of enterococcus to vancomycin uh, comes back to a baseline of much higher. Okay, so this would uh, this would be the same for almost anything that comes and goes from an infection control perspective. Okay, I don't know if I should. I probably shouldn't stop for questions because it'll uh, confuse people uh, muting and unmuting their lines. So we'll keep going and save questions for the end. But uh, note down if there's anything that uh, didn't make sense from that section. Okay, so using your antibiogram, I thought I've got some specific examples of ways that you can use your antibiogram um, because we inevitably get these questions. Even though I think some of us feel like it's straightforward, uh, we'll take you through it anyways. So we'll start with a patient, Ms. D., She's a 70-year-old woman living in a long-term care facility in Regina, and she was diagnosed with a lower urinary tract infection, and a urine specimen was sent to the lab. She was started on Cipro, and the next day the lab reports that she has 10 to the 8th of E. coli in her urine, with susceptibility to results to follow. Okay? So is that okay? Does that look like a fine thing to do? We can just sign off on it? So... If you want to be an antimicrobial steward, you can go and you can check the antibiograms. And the E. coli cumulative susceptibility to Cipro in our health region overall is about 82%. So that's a pretty robust number. It, the number of isolates is over 5,000 that were tested and greater than 82%. So we do give you subgroup analyses uh, in our QHR, one of them being urine specimens alone which is quite similar, 83%. And that's not to be unexpected because gram-negative organisms in micro labs, for the most part, are predominantly coming from urine specimens. So you will notice subgroups that are, they often try to shave off urine versus non-urine. And that's because out of 5,000 E. coli that we did susceptibility testing on, almost 4,800 of them came from urine specimens, right? So if you're trying to predict the susceptibility of an E. coli not in the urine, then the overall estimate is maybe not as useful to you. We also added another uh, subgroup this year, though, with long-term care residents. And this is the first year we did that, mostly because of IT reasons that we weren't capable of pulling these out previously. But now that we have, we see that E. coli's coming from long-term care residents in the city only have a 55% susceptibility to Cipro. So that was shocking and disappointing when we saw that. Uh, so we could look, we could say that that's fine, 
you know, or we can look for other options on the antibiogram and you can go and look at the E. coli's and what kind of boxes are green and, and have a high predictive value of susceptibility. And nitroferentoin, if you had the uh, opportunity to use it, overall it's 97% susceptible. In urine specimens, similarly, and in long-term care residents, it has equally not taken off with resistance. Okay? So you could do that. You could step them down to a more narrow spectrum drug like nitroferentoin. You know that it's uh, E. coli now. Okay. Another example, Mr. J. So 48-year-old man on chemotherapy that is diagnosed with sepsis. And we're skipping all other relevant clinical history. Uh, blood cultures were sent to the lab. He was started on Piptazo. And the next day, the lab reports uh, gram-positive cocci and clusters in his blood culture. And if you're in Regina, hopefully within a couple hours, we will be able to give you a presumptive ID that tells you it's Staphylococcus epidermidis. So susceptibility is going to take another day. Do we think that Piptazo is going to be OK? So some people in the room will just say, I know off the top of my head that that's not going to be OK. But there's other people who are not necessarily as comfortable predicting the susceptibility of individual bugs. Okay? So you can go to the antibiogram and look at the cumulative susceptibility to beta-lactams for RQHR and see that it's only about 30% overall and only about 25% in blood isolates. Okay? So that's clearly not going to be a sufficient empiric treatment. And then you can look across. The only drug that is going to be listed on blood culture isolates that is reliable for coagulase negative staph is vancomycin. Okay, so it's more of an aid. So it's not necessarily this isn't going to this isn't added information. It's a different source for the same information that you might get elsewhere. Okay. Now, baby G. This will be our last example, but this little kid is diagnosed with pneumonia. And so it, this may or may not happen, but let's pretend that they did send a nasopharyngeal aspirate to the lab and then started them on azithromycin. Sounds like something that might happen. The lab is going to report a gram stain to you right away. And they tell you that there's four plus uh, white blood cells, two plus squamous cells, four plus gram positive diplococci, and one plus mixed morphotypes. Okay. That's all the information you're going to get that day. We're, they're going to culture it and do IDs, and then susceptibilities will take in probably another two days. So things that you need to be able to have the background knowledge to, to understand from a microbiology point of view is what is causing this baby's pneumonia? Who can tell me? Strep pneumo. Strep pneumo. So when the, lab, when the lab says it's gram-positive diplococci, you can translate that into your brain that we think it looks like strep pneumo. And I've told our technologists that that is what you are going to translate that into. So strep pneumo does look very specific, looking down the microscope. So it is absolutely an expectation that, that microbiology can say that looks like gram-positive diplococci. Okay. You'll also notice that azithromycin is not going to be listed on our antibiogram for strep pneumo. So what, but we do, we do actually assume that you can, you know this. So what do we report instead of azithromycin? Anybody? Erythromycin. Erythromycin. Keener in front. Okay. So erythromycin predicts susceptibility to macrolides in gram-positive organisms. Okay, so in if we go and look at our antibiograms, uh, the cumul cumulative susceptibility to macrolides predicted by erythromycin is 75% overall. In pediatrics, it's even a little lower, about 70%. So you could say, depending on the clinical state of this child, if they are doing well and they're clinically fine the next day maybe they're one of the 70, 75%. If they came back to emerge the next day and you're looking at this, 
then maybe they're in that 25 to 30% of the population, and you might want to pick something that is going to be more reliable. So what could you pick? So as far as oral options go, the only other really good uh, drug on there is going to be Septra that gets up to 90% susceptibility. And then for beta-lactams, I want to show you what we mean when we report things like this. So hopefully this doesn't seem confusing to people, but what th this is kind of cut and paste from our antibiogram. So this means that we tested 114 strep pneumo isolates to both penicillin and ceftriaxone. And there are different breakpoints to interpret susceptibility depending on the route of administration of beta-lactam drugs. So for penicillin, if you're giving them a pill so of penicillin or amoxicillin, those isolates are going to, 80% of them are going to be susceptible. If they have got, if you are treating them with an IV form of penicillin or, or ampicillin, that's going to be the IV NM non-meningitis, and it's 100%. So if you're going to put this kid on, uh, on, uh, on IV, and they do not have any indication that they have meningitis, you will be 100% predictive that they should respond to ampicillin, IV. However, particularly in little people, if you do not trust that they don't have a component of meningitis, that's the IVM drug. So that is you are going to give the penicillin via an IV route treating a meningitis presentation. And so what is what the difference in interpretation here is that the penetration of these drugs into the CSF is lower than what we can achieve in the, in the blood. Okay. So if, you, if you're treating a meningitis isolate, you need a more susceptible bug to reach effective therapy and good outcomes. Does that make sense? And it's similar to with ceftriaxone. So ceftriaxone has an IV meningitis and an IV non-meningitis breakpoint. If you are treating this organism with ceftriaxone uh, for a presentation that has meningitis, 7% of those isolates will actually be resistant, which is a little disturbing. Uh, and if you're using ceftriaxone for a non-meningitis presentation, then you're going to have 100% coverage. Okay. Okay, enough about that. So I get asked this not infrequently. I just want to use somebody else's antibiograms, or I'm from uh, Vancouver and I've got the Vancouver antibiogram, you know, memorized. I don't want to use your guys's. Well, you you can, but you probably shouldn't. And it's kind of the the idea of you know, <coughs> can you fit into somebody else's shoes? Well, you can, and that does mean that you're wearing shoes, and so that's probably a good thing. But if you don't have to wear somebody else's shoes and you can wear your own, that's better. Okay. So there is, there can be fairly significant differences in the microbial populations of different geographic locations, even within a fairly uniform setting. Well, I don't even want to call Canada a uniform setting. So the resistance rates are influenced by prescriber patterns locally. We do have uh, people traveling and mixing and matching and going other places, uh, but realistically, if your patient is from Regina, they might not have the same microbial exposures and microbial flora inherent to them as somebody living in Vancouver. Okay. And that's not just resistance, that's any infectious disease. I mean, if you are uh, looking at a case of fever of unknown origin and the person just got off the plane from Nairobi, your differential diagnosis is going to be completely different than a fever of unknown origin in somebody that hasn't been anywhere outside of Moose Jaw. Okay? Uh, and the, a, an additional kind of fake problem is the variability in lab practices, and specifically in the testing methods, breakpoints, reporting, cascading. 
uh, and all of those things that influence what an antibiogram looks like, uh, those also are going to result in different predictive values that might not be as accurate as what you're going to get from the local one. Okay? It is reasonable to consider the patient standing in front of you. So if you want to be very keen, or if you have a med student that you want to give them an assignment when they are picking their antibiotic, and this individual standing in front of you is actually from Vancouver and just got off the plane from Vancouver, it would be appropriate to use Vancouver's antibiogram to inform your prescribing compared to Regina's. Okay. Uh, so I am rather... Uh, wordy, aren't I? Okay, so I will whiz through this section. Um, how can you find the antibiogram? So for RQHRs, you can search RQHR antibiogram and you will end up with this page front and center. You can also find it uh, on the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program website under resources for health providers and administrators. Uh, and then it is also on the microbiology intranet site if anybody cares. But usually the uh, RQHR or rqhealth.ca departments under lab services antibiograms is the easiest. And if you just can't uh, abide by leaving your antibiogram in your office or in your, in your bag and you want it with you at all moments in time, you can download the antibiograms app, which we have developed um, that is free to download for users. So you can put it on your iPhone or any of your app Android dev devices. It is the only thing that comes up when you search for antibiograms, or I shouldn't say the only, but it is the first thing that comes up. So you download it onto your device, and then, this is the catch, if, this app is essentially a reader, is what it is. So it is a reader that presents information from a database file, a .db file. So you need a .db file from your lab. Okay. Uh, when you, so you're going to have that. We're going to tell you where you're going to get it from. Uh, it's going to be either in your email or you've gone to the website. You click on it and it will say, what do you want to open this with? You tell them that you want to open it with the Antibiograms app and it should populate. Okay. Uh, if you are working in a lab in Saskatchewan and you want to create a database, database file from an existing Antibiogram that you have, Give me a call and I will help do that for you. So when you first open it up on the Antibiograms app, this is what you're going to see. There are three little buttons at the bottom, an info button, a bug button, and a person button. The first thing you want to do is click on the info button and select your database. Okay? So you don't use the preloaded database. It's fake with just made up names. So it, it's not, you, you should hopefully know that. I've gotten questions, though, that are wondering what these organisms are. So select the one that you're going to use. And then you're going to select the bug that you're interested in. And then you're going to select the subgroup that you're interested in. Once you've selected all these things, you will come up with one of these uh, listings of all of the drugs that we've tested that are listed in the PDF table, but they are available on your mobile device. If you see little asterisks, so on this sheet you can see um, next to the E. coli label there's a little asterisk. That means that there is a comment associated with that organism and we can put in helpful information about the bug itself uh, and, and the drug itself. So drugs can also have those little asterisks and they will pop up comments for you. Pharmacists, if you want to add information to these and you want to populate things with extra information about bugs or drugs, I am more than happy to include that in there for you. But then some people just really are different, and that's where subgroups come in, and subgroups are quite useful. So when we talk about these being essentially surveys to predict the, the likelihood of a result for the next bug that you're encountering, they are going to be influenced by the patient that you're looking at and the specimen that you're submitting. So we do have subgroups for these um, patients and specimens right now. Uh, I've got ICU and pediatrics in brackets because they do not have enough volume in those categories to give them yearly antibiograms. But what we can do is it's 
there have been studies that show it's more accurate to lump isolates over time for a given subgroup than to combine subgroups. So let's say, you know, pediatrics. Pediatrics really often are different, and but pediatrics in 2014 are probably not that different than pediatrics in 2016. So we've lumped pediatric results for three years in a row, and that gives us enough predictive value and enough data to provide them with an antibiogram. Same thing we do for ICUs. Um, bloods, urines, non-urines, we've talked about why that's fairly important. And then occasionally, we similarly do not get enough susceptibility for anaerobes or yeast isolates um, in a given year, so we lump them into multi-year uh, antibiogram results. If you are in Regina and you have a particular aching desire to find out a different subgroup population, do come and talk to us. There are limitations in what our lab information system is able to pull out accurately, but if we can help you out, we can try. And then this is just a comment of what's going on nationally with antibiograms. So there has been a big push for local places to design their own antibiograms and then be able to in, inform empiric therapy based on local expertise interpreting their antibiograms. And you do now get uh, non-homogenous recommendations for empiric therapy across the country. So based on antibiogram results in BC, they have changed what they consider empiric adequate therapy. Uh, similarly with Quebec, and so similarly, we hope that within the new amalgamated Saskatchewan Health Authority that we can collaboratively kind of make custom-made recommendations for Saskatchewan. On a national level, there is a large desire for this type of information from a surveillance point of view. So just a couple organizations that are spearheading this. So CNISP, the Canadian Nosocomial Infection Surveillance Program, uh, which both Regina and Saskatoon take part in, have got an antibiogram project, which we are um, essentially collecting routinely available antibiograms from the hospitals across country that, part, that uh, are involved in other projects and amalgamating them and presenting them together. We did have one abstract uh, at a conference this year, but I wasn't necessarily comfortable presenting those pre preliminary results to you guys today. Uh, but hopefully we will have more more data to present uh, and, and circulate at a later date. Simultaneously, and in collaboration with CNISP, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, many people have heard of this pan-Canadian framework on antimicrobial resistance, and it's one of its branches that it is primarily focused on is surveillance itself. And so surveillance of antimicrobial resistance is kind of exactly the description of an antibiogram, so how can we turn these routinely collected data into robust surveillance information, even despite all of those caveats that I've described to you with the limitations of this data? So we're working on that. And then uh, we, pro we hopefully will also be rolling national data up to this GLASS project, which is being organized by the WHO, the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System, which is providing kind of standardized methodologies for what data they want to see and what they want to wrap up so that they can provide countrywide estimates and see how bad things are getting, how quickly across the globe. So I believe that I am out of time. So this was the uh, bonus section with microbiology information that I included in case I had time to describe it. But I would invite you to uh, book me for another presentation so you won't miss out on any of this really, really exciting stuff that we are doing in the microbiology lab. But I will leave it there and we can take any questions that people have. Hi, Dr. Minion. Hello. It's Pam Nyholt from North Battleford. I was asking a question about your app. Um, I know when I spoke with you a couple of years ago about getting that, you'd mentioned it was free, but there was a cost for us to have it 
to have our file uploaded into that. Is there any way that, um, now that we're going to be one health region, that that's going to become a provincial app that everybody will be able to use, or not really? Uh, yes, so the the fee is for them to turn your like Excel sheet into a .db file. If you can do that on your own, you don't have to pay them. I can do that on my own, so you can just send me your Excel sheet and I will do it for you. Awesome, thank you. Crystal clear? I think one of the questions we often get is if I'm from a smaller place that doesn't have their own antibiogram, what's my option? What's my best option? So your best option is probably to use the community subgroup of your biggest center that you are referred into. So the there so SDCL, the provincial lab, does have an antibiogram. It is not it intended to be predictive of the community across the province. Uh, and it's because these antibiograms, like we've discussed, are essentially surveys that are highly dependent on what isolates the lab receives. So as our provincial reference center, they do not see a, a representative section of all E. coli's in urine, right? They are more likely to see hard to identify and hard to test or highly drug resistant bugs being sent in. There are certain communities who, where all of their microbiology go to SDCL, but at the moment they're not broken, they're not able to be broken out into those specific communities. So I think that for clinical purposes, it's probably most accurate to, if you are close, find the lab that is kind of closest to you and the most similar to your patient population within the province and use their community subgroup. So say I have a patient with a stenotrophomonas infection who has a true sulfa allergy. Yeah. I, I look on the bugs and drugs and see that other empiric therapy is doxycycline. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand why tetracycline wouldn't be Susceptibility for so it is tested as a second line drug. It's just not tested on all isolates. So, and this is mostly this is for cost purposes, literally in the lab. That if ninety five percent of the time you're going to individuals are going to only need one drug tested, then it is far more cost effective to test that one drug on everybody and then use kind of a special circumstance to test the resistant isolates or the, the self-allergic patients, uh, those second line drugs. So uh, if we told you that of the, of the isolates that we tested for tetracycline, 50% of them were susceptible, that's only representing the bugs that were isolated from people with self-allergies or bugs that already had sulfur resistance. And so when we talk about resistance mechanisms liking to travel together in groups, an isolate that is already resistant to one drug is more likely to be resistant to a second drug. So you're going to get a false impression of the resistance of those second line drugs. So yeah. Could you use trauma thermal Oh, as far as treatment for, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know if, if stenotrophomonas is susceptible to trimethoprim, but regardless, the, as far as the susceptibility goes, it would be, that's, that's kind of the explanation of why we don't test it. Available, available <coughs> online. Yeah. So yeah. So all of those, the websites that we talked about that you can access the antibiogram. There are PDF files with the tables themselves and the database files. That so once you download the app, it's on your phone. Go to the website, open the file, and then the file, the your your device should say, "What do you want to open this with?" And you can open it with that program. So. So when I go, I have the app open, and when I go to databases, 
I can't do it, but that's not how I update the headset. No. So you've got the app on your phone. You just close it. And then you go to your browser or your email program, wherever that database file is, and then you then you just open it. Just open it on your phone like you're opening a PDF file. And now you the the app is like a reader. It's like Adobe to open PDF files. So you have to download this. So the 2015 is the one. 2016. 2016. Yeah. 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 Yeah.